So today we're going to be starting off with talking about a little bit more preamble involving graphs. So up to this point, we've talked about what we call unweighted graphs. So these are graphs that for which the connections between the endpoints of vertices, that's what really matters. So for example, we can compute all sorts of different things such as spanning trees, paths, all sorts of things of that sort. However, what if I actually want to use a little bit more to represent my graphs? So that brings me to our first kind of one of our generalizations we're going to talk about here today. It's what we're going to call weighted graphs. So weighted graphs. So you might ask, Dan, what is a weighted graph? Put very simply, it is where where we assign weights or costs uh, to vertices or edges in a graph. So you might say, Dan, what's that all about? So we're going to focus only on when we assign weights or costs to the edges, but I must stress that there are ways you can study different graph theoretic problems by also assigning such things to the vertices too. But for our discussions, whenever I talk about a weighted graph, it'll always be on the edges, just for the sake of clarity, unless otherwise stated. So what do I mean by this? So just to give you kind of a definition here, a weighted graph, weighted graph, G is equal to VE. Remember, V is the set of vertices, E is the set of edges, where, where there is a number associated with each edge called its weight or cost. So specifically for those that are a little bit more enthused on a more precise definition, we're going to have what we call a weight function or cost function, i.e. there's going to be a weight function W, which is going to take in an edge as input, and it's going to spit out an integer. That's just the way we're going to define our weight function. There's nothing particularly special about this weight function, just that it takes in an edge and it spits out a, a number. So for our discussion, I'm just going to make it an integer. Such that W of E, where that's an edge, is the cost or weight of edge E. I think that's pretty straightforward, right? So let me let me give you an example of what I mean by this is you can have some vertices here. I'm just gonna number them one, two, three, four, like this. So notice that I haven't assigned any weights or costs to the edges here at all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to prescribe them by drawing or numbering them on the edges themselves. So for example, I can have this one have a weight of the edge one, two with weight of five. Maybe that's three, maybe that's two, maybe this is 10. So in this example here, the weight of one, two is five. And I must stress that this is more of an abbreviation because I could also write this as one, two, like this. Um, so if that's edge E, that's an example right there. Let's do another one just to make sure I'm clear. As well as the weight one, three, that's 10. This is an undirected graph, so the way I write the edges doesn't matter. It could be the weight of three, one, that's also 10. 
You can define weighted graphs on directed edges as well. But for our discussions here, we're going to focus on undirected graphs. Now you might say, Dan, what benefit does exactly formulating a weighted graph like this? Like, why should we care? So they can represent all sorts of different things. So some examples of weighted graphs. You could imagine the weights being distances between locations. Might be distances between some location, some length. So the edges would have some length. So these are very common in what we call routing problems. So routing problems very often will formulate graphs like this. So very common in what we call routing problems. So for example, if I want to go from point A to point B in a graph, which you could formulate as all sorts of different things. And the weighted graph, the weights represent, say, distances or lengths of, say, a some segment from getting from A to B. Say, A and B are adjacent vertices for each other. You might ask the question of how do I go from A to B to B to C to C to D. So there's certain classes of problems called routing problems where this might be an interesting formulation. Another one is it might be a load to carry from one location to another. So you might say, Dan, what is this all about? So you can imagine each one of these edge weights being a cost associated with taking some resource and allocating it to one of its endpoints. So for example, you could imagine this, say, these two being two depots, say one and two here being a depot, and say there's some commodity that has to be allocated, say, that represents that edge right there, between one and two, and you have to decide which of the two should the commodity be transported to. So you can formulate this in many different ways. It may be just simply an orientation of an edge, what we call an orientation problem. Or it may be the case that you have to transport a good from location to location to location, such as what we'd see in a transportation network or transportation problem. So another way you can also imagine these things is as costs for manufacturing or building. So it might even be the cost to build connections, build connections between two sites. And I mean like physical sites. So you can imagine the sites being vertices in this graph. And the connections that are possible, suppose that these are plans, and you have to decide which subset of those edges, which are going to be connections between your sites, which ones you're going to build. So the edge weights would represent the costs on those, okay? So you might ask, Dan, why would you care about this? Well, also, there's other graph theoretic problems where this might be highly relevant. One early application of specifically thinking about these types of things is one, physically building bridges between site to site. Like say if I want to go from point A to point B, but I also want to minimize the cost of building all of these bridges so that I can ensure I can go from A to B, but it doesn't matter where A, what island or what location A is on to get to B. Now we're not minimizing anything other than the fact that we can get from one place to another place. The fact that it exists. So you might have building costs you may want to minimize when you're doing this process. We'll have more discussion about this when we discuss the minimum spanning tree problem. But one thing I should point out is that this question is actually quite intimately tied around telecommunications. Because a lot of early telecommunications problems were, hey, look, I want to go build lines that take me from, take and transport goods, say, for example, electricity, or phone lines, for example. I want to take it so I could transmit that information, but I need these lines built. 
from like say A to B or one to two here, for example. But I also need to make sure I'm able to do this for over all the entire network or graph. So this is very commonly a way you can interpret this from more of a telecommunication standpoint. So, so I'll see applications in telecommunications. So you can think of it as networks broadly. So if you need to deliver something, you need to make sure you want to build the infrastructure for your network. You want to maybe minimize the cost to build that network. So these, you can think of this as another network design kind of problem. So a couple of things I want to bring up about weighted graphs, just as important remarks, is that it's actually really easy to represent a weighted graph once you know how to represent a graph. So I already had the discussion about this previously, but uh, We can represent these weights quite simply. We can represent these these edges, these are, sorry, these weights. I'm getting very excited here. Quite simply, right? So all you're going to do is you associate each edge with that weight. So you, just like we had in our definition of the weight function. Associate each edge with its weight. So when you we originally were encoding the edge objects, we can still store that information with it just as an additional attribute. Or if you wanted to say represent, say, the adjacencies between two vertices by some incident edge, rather than just encoding that it exists, instead of it just saying it, oh yeah, one, it exists versus zero, no, it doesn't exist, you can actually assign the weight to say, hey, look, I am that thing. And now you might ask, OK, well, are cost functions capable of including numbers like 0 and the negative numbers? So you might need another thing to represent whenever there isn't an edge, which I'll discuss that right now. So in an adjacency matrix, so a common way to deal with this, with an adjacency matrix, is if There is an edge, E, sorry, that's a little squished in there. E is going to be equal to UV. What we're going to do is we're just going to simply assign his appropriate slot or entry in the two-dimensional table or two-dimensional array, A sub U sub V. I'm going to assign that to be the weight of the edge. Pretty easy, right? And whenever there does not exist an edge, such as uh, there is no adjacency there, and otherwise you're going to set its weight to be infinity otherwise. So that means that that spot is going to have an infinity in there. You might ask, Dan, how do you represent infinity on the computer? Well, if you know if your input always has positive integers, you can always make this like negative 1. Or if they have numbers, say these are like physical numbers that are measured with like floating point numbers, for example, which of course you have to take into carefulness when you're dealing with those types of things. Um, there's also special representations for floating point numbers that account for things like infinity that you might want to take advantage of. Uh, so that's one thing that also exists, or you just make it a really large number. <laughs> that's the easiest way you can think about this. Some number that's so big that you never use it. Something that's very easy for you to detect, you can give that a name. You can just call it infinity. Something that many programming languages are capable of doing. So instead, if you ever find yourself looking at your adjacency matrix and you're like, hey, look, I want to actually have it where it stores a pointer or a reference to an edge object, you can simply store that with the edge object, right? So I should mention that. Uh, so in our generalized scheme, so I made some note about this, that you can store the pointer to an edge object in this. So in the generalized scheme, uh, just store 
weight with the edge object. So you'll have an edge object that you've created when you created that edge originally. It's pointing, the, the pointers exist in the spots which would be within the adjacency matrix. So you just update what the weight would be if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then you just have it where the entry just has null like we had before. So when I talk about, I'm talking about like specifically the pointer is null. In an adjacency list, it's also a pretty piece of cake. It's quite similar to this. So everywhere you had an edge, you'll just associate it with the edge. It's pretty easy. So you, so depending on how you classically represent it, you may have it where it's the opposing endpoint plus the edge weight. So you'd have these two attributes that you have at your disposal in the representation for the adjacency list. Otherwise, if you're using more of this O-like way of thinking about it, you might literally just mean this, which is pretty easy, right? So that being said, in all of these configurations, if you have access to an edge, you have access to the weight. So a big assumption in the way you're implementing this, and it's a fairly straightforward assumption. It should be fairly easy to implement this. The assumption is that it takes cost and time to access the weight of edge E given E. That's something I'm going to make a presumption about in this discussion. <laughs> okay? So that's weighted graphs. So we're going to be exposed to these in the upcoming lessons. Okay, everybody?